we've met on social media, right? And so I've enjoyed following you and especially just all of the ACT information, acceptance and commitment therapy that you've shared has just been so on point for me and, and my work and, and my focus. So what led you to acceptance and commitment therapy and ACT and shifting your focus? Well, <laughs> that's a general question. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, no, I think that what led me to act was actually a need for it, right? My life necessitated support in that way. And because of my behavioral background, I was having a harder time connecting to more traditional CBT psychotherapy and being able to make that work for me. And in the place that I was in, I needed support as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not to make light of it, that laughing is the way that I cope with things sometimes, mm -hmm. but it was a very challenging situation and a time in my life. And so when I started with a psychiatrist who was versed in DBT and ACT, and she started to explain things to me from more of the behavioral perspective and being able to use, you know, my background to kind of frame how that was working, it changed my life. Like my entire life changed. <laughs> and I was like, yes. people need this information. So from receiving it, right, being the client side of the table, understanding that I was able to figure out how to, you know, go back to learning, continuing education. I got to meet a whole lot of amazing people and do a whole lot of amazing things to try to bring more act to more people more often because of how life-changing it was for me. So that was really what started that journey was me needing it. And I actually believe that that is what makes my practice so well-rounded is mm -hmm. that I practice act with myself all the time. Yes. Yeah. I definitely feel that for myself of starting off with it for myself and then wanting to share it with everyone like this. I have to put this into everything I do. And I think I can't even help not seeing it. In, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but it just interweaves into everything so beautifully. And I think even you are saying like, oh, that kind of sounds like act. That's kind <laughs> of like the act matrix. <laughs> yeah. So it's just everybody needs to, to have this shared with them, come from the same kind of background of how I started with it. You came from a traditional behavioral background, right? And then shifted. Yes. And so tell us a little bit about your coaching. You have a lot of different programs out there. You're, you're coaching, you've got uh, BCBA burnout groups and all kinds of good <laughs> stuff. Do you want to share a little bit about those, those programs? Yeah. So in the same vein as what I just kind of said, I really push that act is something we practice and then we do with someone rather than to them mm -hmm. right and so the more that we practice that for ourselves the more we're going to be able to support other people from a place of meeting them where they're at because we've done some of that hard stuff rather than going with like logic and theory right mm -hmm. <laughs> when we understand the extent of the challenge because we have overcome some of our things from that place we're going to practice with people so fundamentally different. And it, to me, it's what changes the behavioral science lens. Like it makes it chef's mm -hmm. kiss, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I started practicing ACT as a clinician, right? Like I had been, I've been practicing ACT for myself for a really, really long time. But when I got the chops, I got the supervision, I got all the continuing education and things like that. I started putting it into practice in, in my clinical setting. I started with the teens and the tweens who were my people, right? Mm. Those, that was my niche in clinical setting was the teens and tweens with co-current diagnoses that also fall into like depression and anxiety and things like that. And then I became a parent during that time. And so I also started working more and more and more with the clients who I saw as parents. And over and over and over again, that parental burnout was impacting therapy, right? So I ended up doing some really cool things with the parents. I promise this is going to tie in. <laughs> and so when I started trying to teach other clinicians how to do act with parents, because I was getting all of the like challenging parents in the clinic or the ones who people historically were having a tough time with, I realized that they really couldn't, like the clinicians couldn't access how to support these parents because of their own individual burnout. Mm. So being able to find a way to support these people who just aren't doing the thing that 
they said they would do, right? <laughs> when I've got a hundred million other things on my plate was beyond their capacity. Like they weren't able to really meet those people where they were at because it was just another ask of them when they were already too far gone, which was the same thing with the parents, right? Mm. And so I realized that helping the clinicians was going to be the biggest way to have more impact on our community as a whole and on people as a whole. And that's a values word for me, right? Mm -hmm. If we go back to my own act practice, being able to impact more people more often was what I wanted to do. And so being able to help people with burnout seemed in service of helping the parents in service of helping the kids seemed like the right move. But then as I kind of did that burnout work with more and more people, I realized that there was a lot of, and I experienced it too, right? Like I kind of moved on outside of traditional clinic setting that there were some things that they really couldn't overcome with traditional burnout in the settings that they were in. And so being able to help them with business development or thinking about career shifting ended up being another thing that I needed to do to help support these people so that they could have something sustainable to be able to do the work that they wanted to do. And it just kind of kept evolving from there, <laughs> right? Like it's still all in service of kind of the same thing, helping help people live lives that they love. But as I explore it further and further, I see a need for more little things. And then I create those and it's fun. It's really, really fun. <laughs> cool. That's love it. Awesome. Love it. Tell me what, for people who may not know, what is ACT? What does it mean to you? And what value or who could benefit from learning about it or using it and incorporating it in their life? Yeah. I mean, that's a beautiful question. And it's, so I'm going to start with the first part, right? So acceptance and commitment therapy is, you know, I say it's the data-driven a uh, brand of mindfulness. I think mindfulness is a word that most people know. And sometimes it gets a little watered down because there's lots of people saying, talking about mindfulness. And so this is more of the like clinical term around mindfulness. The act that I really practice is the Hexaflex version. I heard you guys mention the matrix mm -hmm. earlier. That one's not my personal fave, but I understand mm -hmm. it as a tool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm a, a big believer in the Hexaflex model which stems in acceptance, right? So acceptance is not shit happens. Sorry. I don't know if you guys are okay with swearing on this one. <laughs> Things happen. <laughs> Things happen and it's uncomfortable. And so I just have to accept it or resign right? That's not acceptance in this, in this category. Acceptance is that things can be challenging, things can be overwhelming, and that we still get to move towards what matters to us, right? And mm -hmm. so it's about being able to make the life you want to live and targeting the thoughts, thinking that you can't move towards that as the problem over the environmental factors, right? And being able to find ways to move forward, which is different than traditional behavioral backgrounds. Behavioral therapy is usually rooted in modifying the environment to help the individual flourish. Whereas mindfulness is more about changing your perspective to be able to see different opportunities that you couldn't see before so that you interact with your environment differently. So, then yeah, you get yeah. to create a life that you love, even though ne not necessarily things change, right? So it's like the idea of changing the way that you interact with work, for example, changing the way that, you know, where you work or how you work or how you support yourself with, to help your burnout in order to do more of the stuff that you love sustainably so that you can do more of what you love longer, right? So really, it, it, it doesn't doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter the environment. It's it's kind of change, shifting your mindset to be flexible to navigate and overcome any environment to live in your values and the life. Right? You want to leave? Yes. Thank you. That's a beautiful summary. <laughs> you, you explained it very well. And who could benefit? Who, who? I would say we all could. Right? I, I think there's some value for all of us, but. Maybe I'm a little biased. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I agree with you. I think everyone can benefit. I think that sometimes the technical definition of who can benefit is those with a big enough vocabulary to experience suffering, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So there are individuals who, for whom might not have the vocabulary to fill that out. And that's perfect, right? But for the people who, I mean, so in Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, 
which is a kind of a seminal one for me by Steve Hayes, they talk about language is the root of all suffering, right? Yes. So if you've got uh -huh. a big enough vocabulary to relate to your yeah. time, relate to your history, relate to your future, be able to change the way that you think about things, then act is for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I heard somebody talk about in one of their ACT presentations that we're always languaging ourselves. And that's, yeah, the cause of our suffering. We're mm -hmm. languaging. Uh, we're always putting all these words to it. And we're always just labeling things and judging things and getting hooked by things. And yeah, the, the more we can diffuse from that and unhook, right, and be mindful and present and that's going to help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I definitely, I think everyone can benefit <laughs> if, if, like, I like the way you put that with, um, so they kind of have to have that repertoire, right? They have to have the, the language to. In your bio, you were <laughs> behavioral. You had your, your first child, it sounded like, and realized that something was missing or something. I'm not sure how you put it in your bio, but it, it needed something else, right? And I think we both have kind of seen that and gone through that and developed a, those additional skills through other certifications and therapies to provide kind of more I don't want to say holistic approach mm -hmm. to the individual, mm -hmm. not just treating the target behavior or deficit, but more of looking at, what would you say, more having... I, I think holistic, relationship-based. Relational-based and mm -hmm. including the private events and all these stuff. But mm -hmm. what, what was your experience when you had your child that made you realize maybe my what I'm doing or what I'm offering wasn't uh, where you wanted it to be? Like low key embarrassing, right? <laughs> <laughs> because there was definitely some things that, you know, like I did based off of other people, you know, my supervisors or the books or whatever, telling me what's the right way to go about things. And there's a lot of things that I, I wish that I could go back and, and do differently yeah. now. Yeah, sign me up. Yeah. Same here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you're all there, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, because it's just so much different when you live it. Like there's no, like there is no perfect parenting, right? Mm -hmm. It's just about moving towards what matters most to you and being able to kind of balance all of those things in service of sustainability, right? Because we can't parent perfectly or we're not going to parent for very long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and perfect is in soft quotes, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we can do things better. We can always be learning. And I think for the most part in my clinical setting, I was before I had kids, I ended up just not understanding the true bandwidth challenges that parents interact with on a daily basis. Like there's just not enough time. There's just not enough energy. And they, these people are doing their ever loving best and they are kind of hurting themselves doing it. And so it created like loops of unsustainability that I was perpetuating, right? And I wouldn't be able to do or keep track of some of the things that maybe I was asking of my parents. Yeah. And then I had parents with more than one kid who I was seeing, right? So we're just adding layers and layers and layers mm -hmm. of challenge there. And so when I realized that pretty early on, because I, I suffered with postpartum depression, I was like, this is not this is not it. Like, this is not going to be the way that I do this moving forward. I don't a hundred percent know what I need to do differently. So we went and talked to Evelyn, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Evelyn Gould was one of my mentors. She's just fantastic in this realm. If anyone's ever interested in supporting parents, she's, she's, she's it, right? <laughs> I do have my own book too, around that realm and supporting parents, but like, it's, like I knew I had to figure out something differently because I just could not continue saying the things or recommending the things that I was doing in my clinical practice to parents any longer. Mm. Initially, right? Which sucks like, a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you're like, why can't the parent just do this if they just did what I told them, right? And, it, and it's so one-sided and so sad to just have that closed-minded perspective that mm -hmm. you know I had when I first started too, and you know, and then you learn and you grow, right? And we we, we get better. So I think we we're we we're all there and. And some make the switch and, and some keep safe and in, in, in that zone, right? Where I think their their coaches are where how they learn. But for us it's it's one of our I think we're always moving towards seeking perspective and seeking growth and, and learning and, and opportunity. Mm -hmm. So good for you. And that's why you guys <laughs> do what you do now, right? Yeah. Like yeah. like growth mindset is a vibe for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what's kind of, you know, for me, that was a huge part of all of my act um, mm -hmm. information was being able to help parents more as soon as I realized 
I was perpetuating the problem. And meeting them where they're at is important, right? That took probably many years for me to get there right? <laughs> of, of, Hey, are, are they doing their best? You know, to assume that people are doing their best given the tools they have and the education and experience they have, then, you know, that makes it easier for us as clinicians. And, you know, we have more empathy and all around better, better treatment, I think. Mm, yeah. Agreed. Passion. Definitely. Tell Which us why it. act starts with us, right? We have yes. to have that compassion. We have to go through those challenging things to cultivate compassion. Yes, definitely. So tell us about your book that you pointed to back there. Is it what out? What you got going on? <laughs> is it released? Tell us. Yeah, no, this one has been out for a long time. I've got the companion to it. It was supposed to be out this year. Obviously, I didn't get it out this year. I, I, I self-publish, so I have to I produce oh, cool. everything. It's called Seven Days to Clarity, A Parent's Guide to Getting the Most from ABA Therapy by me, Mallory Ooh. Anderson Macy. And it's like a workbook, right? So there's like places for you to do journaling activities. All of them are, you know, mindfulness and act. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you, a parent would be able to do this workbook in seven days mm -hmm. and be able to bring this with them to a meeting with their therapists and their clinicians to be able to kind of roadmap what they need, what they want from a holistic perspective. The second book is supposed to be for, or will be, we'll say that will be to help support clinicians who might ask parents to use this book on how to yeah. like get the most from those exercises mm -hmm. in supporting them. I love that. That's great. We'll have to pick that up. What's right. been your biggest challenge? We're all about thriving and not just surviving. And so in your, I mean, parent parenthood has been a whole different challenge for us as yes. well. And that <laughs> changed our perspective, of course, but you know, going from this shift from kind of just being a more behavioral to this act, I don't know, life coach, guide, guide, what's been your biggest challenge and how have you had the tools or where have you gotten the courage to get through that challenge? I love that question because it's all act. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so because of, of my background, which I kind of uh, glossed over in the beginning, I'm, like I was really in a place where like act saved my life. Like we're not going to be short about that. <laughs> and so being able to find the things that matter to me in life and realize that I have the capacity to be able to move towards those, even though it's challenging was fundamentally life altering for me <laughs> because in kind of my darkest time, I could not ABA my way to happiness. ABA applied behavior analysis. I could not, I could not get myself there. Like I was pushing myself. I was grinding. I wasn't letting myself get out of anything. And I was miserable, miserable. By the time I finally left my job in 2020, I had four resignation letters signed and sealed in my desk that I never had the courage to hand over. And it wasn't because it was a bad place to work. It was because it was no longer the work I wanted to be doing. Right. So it was actually Evelyn, which, you know, shout out to her again. When I got my act coaching, like my supervision, she was like, what are you doing? Right? Like you're talking the talk, but you're not walking the walk, babe. Mm. Um, and so that was a really big call to action for me. And then of course, 2020 was a whole situation in itself. My daughter was born at the very end of 2019. And so when 2020 happened, it was like a push out the door. Like I, my daughter had some health issues, right? So going to the office wasn't a thing that I could do anymore. Working with, you know, the population that I worked with, they didn't necessarily have to mask, which meant that my daughter was at risk and I just couldn't tolerate it anymore. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. So it was the push that I needed to move towards starting my consulting, starting, starting my own business and things like that. And it was terrifying. Like I was, I had a, I was postpartum. I had a brand new baby. I was in a pandemic and I was starting a brand mm. new business. And I had never done any of that before in my entire life all at once. Wow. And I had a toddler too. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Wow. And so that was some of the hardest stuff I've ever done, but it was the most important stuff that I had ever done. I also wrote a book during that time because I wrote that and published that for the first time all in that same year. And it was nuts. It was just bananas. But it was because I had such strong practice in my act skills that I could make that happen. I was scared most of 2020, like everybody else, but like on like so many levels mm -hmm. and then scared into 2021. But it was also 
some of the most empowering stuff I've ever done, right? Because I would go out there and I would do things that I was not sure I could do, right? Like I got some coaching clients, I got some social media following, I started recording things and not having any idea what I was doing, messing up all over the place. And everyone was so like, amazingly supportive and i just had to rely on my act practice like sometimes still even receiving praise is hard for me <laughs> like yeah. wow you've helped me so much i'm like oh me what are you talking about <laughs> and so i like have to practice my own act around receiving like praise uh -huh. even <laughs> or even being invited to something like this every time i'm just like why would they want to talk to me mm -hmm. and i have to go back and be able to, like to rework my act stuff and 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 go back into that so really it is to me working that hexaflex towards psychological flexibility that present moment awareness practice the diffusion work the self as context work acceptance right being able to move into committed action is like that is how I do anything. That is how I do everything. And that is how I like changed my life and why I have yeah. to kind of do the things that I do. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, that is <laughs> beautiful. And it, I, it is life changing. It, I mean, just looking back on what's happened over the past couple of years, because you've really stepped into your own act practice, right? And then shared that with others. It's just amazing what you've been able to accomplish and to be able to take those steps outside of your comfort zone you know, and just keep showing up for things that are scary, but doing it anyway, it's so rewarding. And that's just awesome to hear your path just in just a few years, how much you can accomplish. And that's got to be awesome looking back on all that. Yeah, I'm just wondering what for other people right now, maybe in your previous situation where you were kind of at your low, it sounded like you found a mentor, you found the mate, the act, right? And you had, it sounds like you, you had a tribe who was supportive and very encouraging each step of the way. How did that all come together? Maybe I'm by myself. I feel like I'm not going anywhere in my mm. career. You know, I'm, I'm down in the dumps. Where, wh what would you know, yeah. suggest someone yeah. to, to, to do the first step first for step. someone to get unstuck? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, so when I was working my clinic job, I wasn't necessarily in a tribe of people who were supportive. Like I had, she's an amazing person and a, and a impactful clinician who has done so much amazing work in her lifetime, but she really didn't get act at all. And I like, and she didn't really want it back then. And she's made a whole lot of changes, it seems like. And so I felt like I was like running myself into a brick wall for like three years. I was trying to figure out how to bring more of this, what I was experiencing to my clinic and to my clinicians. And, she, you know, the director was not, and, and the doctorate level was not about it. She did not want it. It's her company. What am I going to do? And so I ended up at the boot camp, right? So the ACT boot camp for BCBAs with Hayes uh, in Reno. And I met Evelyn there. And I had one other person with me in that clinic who was into ACT and we would do book clubs together and whatnot. And so what I would recommend to someone is to find one person, whether that be online, whether that be in a book, like just an author mm -hmm. and start where you're at even though you've got people who are telling you it's not for you or you, you feel like you don't understand it or you're not good enough or whatever, what, whatever it is that you want, like in your stuckness, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that you start becoming aware of how you're stuck and start noticing the stories that you tell yourself about that, right? So for me, the story and the reason I gave you the background there was because I believed that my, I mean, my mentor, right? The director, the doctorate level, someone who like saw me through graduate school, which was a long time ago now, <laughs> she wasn't about it. And so I believed that it wasn't something that I could pursue anymore. And that wasn't true. Like that just fundamentally wasn't true. So I had to notice that I was telling myself something that wasn't true, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the diffusion work, the self is context work, and be able to accept that doing something that she didn't like, or making decisions that scared me about my working placement. Cause I had been there since undergrad, you guys, like mm, I was actually wow. 
like 17 when I started. This was a whole <laughs> different time, right? Where it was it was okay for someone to do that. This is 15 years or more ago mm -hmm. as an RBT, before an RBT was a thing. And leaving that situation was like not even an option. Like my brain didn't even register mm -hmm. leaving. Like it wasn't a thing, right? So when we notice the stories we're telling ourselves, we notice our stuckness and we can tell ourselves different stories, which all comes back to that language component. Mm -hmm. Then we can start making behavioral shifts because we can see a different outcome in our environment that hasn't necessarily changed. Yes. These are not our thoughts, right? We get to notice our thoughts, but we are not our thoughts. My thoughts are these clouds exactly. passing yeah. by and detaching. That's yeah my meditation this morning <laughs> it's a constant constant yes. work for me <laughs> yeah but each little step that you take and each little thing that you do to move out of you know that that stuckness or whatever those thoughts are telling you I definitely relate to you and what you're saying I stayed in a, a at a company for 11 years before we just moved here to Virginia from California and I, I loved it I loved all the people I loved what we were doing and I loved how I was able to incorporate a lot of my background and everything into it but I was telling myself kind of the same things and I didn't realize it I, and I was making myself feel stuck because of like there was no other place for me this was the place this was it this was you know but once Brian and I started kind of stepping out and kind of thinking some different thoughts or or challenging ourselves like well what if we moved to Virginia what if we did this what you know and then it just it it snowballs after that and so I love that for just kind of doing the work and step by step why not why not yeah why, why not we say we thought we had uh julie the hope source gordon julie gordon mm -hmm. she's a mft runs a, a an aba clinic in indianapolis and she's gotten a lot of criticism from a lot of the commu aba community and you know not being a bcba in the insurance carriers and she was considering stepping back and she said you know what i'm going to step forward i'm going to mm -hmm. get uncomfortable i'm going to share that what i'm doing this relational holistic approach fits in with the the science and fits in with mm -hmm. the funding and the definitions and she's start going to aba conferences now and and really sharing the the alternative to what we've all maybe grown up with with the dtt and the very rigid kind of behavioral programs yeah. that i did when i first started my career and she was you know that's stepping forward and it sounds like you're doing the same you know like with your director right it's not okay whatever you want to do and whatever you tell me to do and i don't want to cause any trouble but you know it's not where you want to be. It's not who you want to be. It's not how you want to show up. And right, it's not the overall what we want to provide, right, our clients and, and, and how we want to live our lives. So good for you. I love what you said about like I noticed how I was talking to myself. I noticed what I was thinking and I noticed that I can change it, right? Because mm -hmm. what that implies is that you're taking responsibility for your thoughts over, right, like I've got these positions on me, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is kind of the same part of my story. Like I felt like there, there was this environment that I had created for myself and I couldn't move through it anymore, mm -hmm. right? Like I had made my bed, so I should sleep in it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what a ridiculous thing to say right. to myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can change it the way that you guys changed that, the way that the person who you were just talking about is changing it. And I agree, like when I started going to the, um, the counselor's uh, Continuing education, like I started going to counselor continuing mm -hmm. education over just BCBA. Good That's idea. when everything changed for me, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't get any credits for it, but I was exploring it professionally and it changed. I mean, Robin Walsler is an amazing ACT uh, teacher. She's got a book called The Heart of ACT and she's not a BCBA. Mm -hmm. And she's like fundamentally the person who taught me about trauma-informed therapy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and completely changed it, right? So I love who, you know, I forget her name as you just mentioned it, but the way that that MFT is moving into ABA and how like creating some overlaps is going to make us better. Yeah. Like, right. why not? <laughs> yes. And that's, that's definitely been our approach all along because, and especially mine, because I started off in ABA, very traditional ABA. And then I, I got my RDI consultant certification, relationship development intervention. I got a lot of pushback from, you know, the ABA yeah. community. Um, and then Brian eventually did his as well. Um, but, and that's what I actually loved about ACT so much is I felt like it brought together the ABA side of things, the RDI side of things, my yoga and mindfulness side of things, and just made it in this beautiful little package that I could just, just use it for myself and share it with others. And it just made sense. And there was science behind it. And it was like, oh, you know, this beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. 
But I, I, I just remembered that I reached out to you. I don't know if you remember, but during that journey of transitioning from all those thoughts of stuckness in, in that job that I was in and, and feeling like, oh, well, I, I've got this great job and I should stay here and all of that. And I worked it when I came to Virginia, but I had reached out and you were very helpful just on DMs. So I don't know if you still do that with people, but it was very, it was, it was wonderful just how helpful you were and just the questions that you asked were very thought provoking and just mind shifting and I'm trying to think of another good word that it, but it just really, it was what I needed in that moment. And just that one little snippet of, of talking to you briefly helped me. So I could see how that could really help other people of actually coaching with you and working with you long term. I just remembered that. I forgot yeah, about that. Look at that. It all comes <laughs> circles back. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And I think it, I, I, I don't remember the specific conversation, although I know that we have quite the thread. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it just takes a person from an outside perspective asking you a question you didn't know you needed to ask. Mm -hmm. And then it's a lot of people can run with that, especially if they already have a level of mindfulness practice. But we can't always see the things that we're fused to, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be fused to them. It would be right. easier to, to spot. And so when someone points it out and then clearly you, you're you very skilled in mindfulness to be able to take it and run with it, it is I mean, it's it's a big deal to have someone be able to ask you a question you didn't know that you needed to ask. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not even very challenging work, right? If we let it not be challenging, that's one thing that I, I talk with BCBAs a lot about is that they get all, all up in their head about how they're not sure if they're doing ACT or it's like, is this ACT or is this ABA? And like, am I doing it right? Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, you guys were saying like, oh, I see that. And that's very act, right? Oh, I wonder if that's the act matrix. Like mm -hmm. when you get to the level of fluency where you can start seeing it all around you, right? And like you're dancing that mm -hmm. hexaflex, even just witnessing people dance the hexaflex and being able to do that or see it in books or read about it or read something that uh, that's not act related, like maybe a I've got the book Atomic Habits in front of me uh, right now, uh -huh. and then be able to see how that is ACT, even though they're not talking about it from the ACT perspective, but like your lens is lensing, right? Yep, yep I like that. <laughs> dancing the hexaflex. That lensing, the lens is lensing. <laughs> dancing the dancing hexaflex. with the hexaflex. <laughs> yes. yes right. Cool. And yeah. then that's, that's when it's not it's not just a theory anymore, right? That's when it's the way you live your life. And that's yes. when like we're doing it all the time. And mm -hmm. that's where I, I mean, I'm always going to be working on my practice, but what, why I would be able to, you know, hear you in the DMS for, you know, maybe 10 minutes or whatever, yeah, was... and then be able to kick you a question that's helpful. It's because it's, the thought, right? Mm -hmm. It's the way. <laughs> yes. And it's not, it's not it's one way. hat or the other. I've learned, yes. you know, right. we, no. we, you can't take one hat off and put the other mm -hmm. on. It's it's your holistic universal experience and education that you're presenting at this moment. So people are like, is that I ABA or RDI? It's not, it's, it's, it's both. They're, it's all at the same time, right. which, you know, so that was always, you know, trying to share that was always a little, a little challenging. Mindfulness, Mallory, what is ma mindfulness to you? I know trigger or it's, it's, it's a it's a word used a lot well, you know, this is my happiness word it's right it's 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 very common you see mind, yeah. mindfulness everywhere just it's like become kind of a authentic buzzword in a, right a, authentic yeah. was the word of the year yeah says, oh, says yeah. google yes. right so everything's authentic buzzword. and yeah. buzzword mm -hmm. but what does mindfulness mean to you and how do we get there <laughs> yeah. Can, can I be mindful on this, please? <laughs> so, can I just be done with it? Yeah. No, so, never can, really I mask, can I be master? It, right? ma a master mindful? <laughs> it's a process. Yeah. So, the way that I encourage people to do mindfulness is to make it a practice. You mentioned yoga, right? Which is another, was another part of my journey as well, was being able to connect to my own like i mean my mindfulness practice is mm -hmm. is also physical right and that goes into being behavioral right like you were just saying these things go together right mm -hmm. and so what i encourage people to do and i have a youtube series on mine that's just called getting started or like mindfulness mm -hmm. jumpstart or something mm -hmm. like that probably i made it a long time ago now but <laughs> it's like the things that i do with people the 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 simple exercises that i encourage them to do every single time 
that you're like, I do these quarterly still. Like I go, I take myself to a restaurant once a quarter and I sit down with my journal with no one else. Mm -hmm. And I like do this exercise for myself as well. <laughs> I make my husband do it and then we share so that mm. way we can collaborate. But like make it something that you live, make it something that you do. So the first thing that I usually encourage people is to create a values list. It's probably not going to be a perfect values list, right? But go find a list of values. I usually use the one by Brene Brown and just start with your top 10 and put those, like make them your phone screen lock mechanism make them write them on your mirror with an expo pen uh put them on your dashboard or on your computer wherever you see them frequently and just contemplate your values like what did i do today that embodied my values right <laughs> and start keeping those uh, like memorize them make them something that you can rattle off immediately and that you update regularly right mm -hmm. something that you are changing and you're considering like is this the right one for me i know recently well it wasn't super recently but about a year ago i added the value of audacity which is one that i would have never mm -hmm. added before mm -hmm. but i realized that bold wasn't enough it was to be audacious it was to step outside the box sometimes Mm -hmm. And to do something that people would be upset about even because it was something that mattered to me, not just for the sake of being upset, <laughs> but because I cared about it and to be audacious with it and to see how you're living your values or not and see how you're like, and almost journal about it. I call it intention setting journaling, right? Where you take a goal or you take a value and you're going to contemplate it today, right? I usually write it on my forearm. I just washed off today. <laughs> And what am I contemplating today? What's at the forefront of my mind today? And at the end of the day, journal about it. How did I embody this? Or where were there opportunities to embody this, even if I didn't necessarily do it? It just takes five minutes, right? Like to pick one at the beginning of the day and to write about it at the end and to reflect, but it builds those neural pathways. It gets you thinking about that on the regular basis. And then the other exercises I invite people to do is what I call a balance assessment, where you look at kind of the areas of your life and you see what's in balance to go with what you were saying before about holistic, right? So mm -hmm. what regularly, uh, regularly is not the right word, what, how would I want my life to look like, right? Across these areas of life, how, how important are these things to me, one to 10? And then on a week's basis, how much time or effort are each one of these getting, one to 10? Are they out of balance? It's just a quick anecdotal test to see where you're at with yourself, but then it can be part of your intention setting. Like I am maybe not spending as much time with my partner as I'd like to. And I'd really like to spend more time with my partner. How am I going to make that happen today? Right? Because I noticed that that's out of balance or vice versa. I noticed that I'm spending a lot of time at work. How, where is something that I could put down because I don't want to be spending this much time. Right? And then the last exercise is kind of a day in the life in the future. And kind of, I do it as a meditation. And on my YouTube, there's a meditation that you can walk through with that to just imagine what you want your life to look like, write it down and start intending to do some of those little things more often, right? It, to me, it's what you do is what makes you mindful, right? Because mm -hmm. it's the combination of what matters to me. To me, one of my biggest values is impact. And so, of course, I would say yes to this, even it, to something like this, where I would be able to share, even though I kind of put it as like, this is me on vacation time period. Why not? Right. Impact is a big deal. And I like to do things quickly. So let's do it. Right. Like balancing out those types of things, those values and being able to see how they work in your life and and what you want it to be. And then thinking about it, writing about it is a practice. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a behavior. Nobody's going to say writing is not a verbal behavior. <laughs> and Verbal behavior is the type of intervention that we're doing with ACT, right? So it's how you talk to yourself and how you talk to yourself more often intentionally. Mm. Make it a habit, make it a practice, right? Yes. Make it a thing you do versus just something that comes upon you, you know? Yes. No, those were awesome. Awesome. I was thinking about like, what's, what's your guide? What's your guiding light every day and having it be intentional and not just 
right? Sometimes when it's no, yeah. there's no intention, then it's just reactive, and mm-hmm. then you can get stuck in the yeah. pointy finger and blaming. So I love that. I think that would be very helpful for me. <laughs> so mm-hmm. appreciate that. Tell for us sure. about your Check so- out those little YouTubes. Oops, sorry. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, you Definitely. mentioned the YouTube. What's the your social media? That's a whole other story and journey. What's that process been like for you, and what would you recommend to people who, like myself, may be feeling discouraged or frustrated and nobody sees it and I'm not getting any followers and, you Oof. know, trying to be your authentic Oof. self, but doing what's trendy. <laughs> a lot of questions. In there. <laughs> oh, it's really just social no, media. No, I hear it, though. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear it. it. I, I think that sometimes it's the expectation that shoots us in the foot, mm. right? So sometimes... Like, why would you make social media, right? Like, what does social media do for you? What does it do for other people? And like, check in with your values. Like, why am I doing this? One thing that I've played with over social media is for, I've been doing it for a couple of years now, is that there are certain types of content that gets me followers, right? There's, I, I can, I know how to kind of work that a little bit and I don't like it. <laughs> To be honest, I don't actually care so much right now about my social media follower amount because I've noticed that the right people are way better to hang out with than more people. Mm. And what I want from social media has more to do with like being received rather than, I mean, and I said audacious as a value word or audacity and i mean that but i also don't want like to pick fights with people right like i don't want to put people out like i want people to be able to understand and people to be able to hear and so for me figuring out who i like want to be on social media and what it does for me is the most important thing Right. So, you know, like there's some technical things and I cover this in one of my, one of my courses. It's, I mean, it's, it's called balanced business owner. It's really about making social media platforms and making them profitable. And like, what's your values list for your business? What's your values list for your social media account? Even if it's not for you, like what is it to do for people? What do you want it to do for people? And why can't you not do it? You know, like what is it on your heart that has to spill out of you that you have to share with people? And then how can you get them to receive that even if it's outside of your comfort zone? So you might have to learn something like making reels for a lot of people who I coach, even just putting their face on social media feels really uncomfortable, especially attached to their professional stuff. Like they're cool with taking pictures of their food and their kids and like the scenery when they go Mm -hmm. on vacation, but then like putting their face on their words feels really scary to them. And so that's the acceptance piece, right? Mm -hmm. Like how are we going to move through this idea that it's dangerous or it's uncomfortable, or even just become aware of the thoughts that you're this type of information that you really want to share or finding people for whom it connects with. Yeah. And then what's getting in your way. So like the idea and what you just said uh, that you need a bazillion followers Mm -hmm. might be something that's preventing you from taking that authentic action that would result in a bazillion followers, right? It's sometimes it's like not trying to circumvent the algorithm and it's just really rooting into you and why you're doing what you do. And every time I do that, that's when things pop off. That thing, that's when things do really well. Did that's I answer okay. your question? Good yeah, no, perfectly. No, <laughs> great, great advice. Great advice. Yes. I think that our purpose with starting this podcast was not to get followers for not to people to views or downloads, but really just to meet people and hear their stories and build relationships connect. and connect and you know learn. And I think that has made it you know, easy and, and joyful yeah. for us. There's no pressure. Yeah, you know, we, we enjoy doing this. We have time together that maybe we wouldn't have. So mm-hmm. we're scheduling that and we're meeting great people like you who we would have never met. So right. we're, we're, we're feeling already lucky. So we've already won. So uh, I think that's. Yeah. yeah. So it's taking that lens and putting it on the social media, I think, is, is what you're saying. Doing it for the values that are important to you, the, the who or what's important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if showing up and having fun and connecting with people and uh, meeting new people that are, have the same mindset or are like minded, you know, I think that's. And I think another part is not what can I get out of this? How many followers can I get? But how can I help people? How can I share? How can I share my story uh, that may connect with somebody else like, you know, what you're doing? So I think 
just flipping that mindset. Mm-hmm. It's like the energy, mm-hmm. right? When you let go is when abundance comes. Mm. It's easy. I'm, I'm, I'm getting comes better, honey. Together. There you go. It's all comes together. You're crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. And I think like it is, it can be fun. And yeah. like sometimes we're led to do things that are strategic or we get information from other people to support us getting our message out more. And there's times where that's totally aligned, right? Like, absolutely. Why not? But when you're called to it, right, when it feels like the right move, because you have to get your message out more, like, it's just something that you have to share and spread, like, that's when it's okay to make mistakes. That's when it's okay to play. That's when Mm -hmm. it's okay to do things that are weird and uncomfortable. And that's when that's when it's successful, in my opinion. Failing forward, right? Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) you have to have to put yourself out there. Yes. Yeah. All right. So thinking back to your younger self, would there be a piece of advice or three things or anything that you would look back and tell yourself and say, like, this is it. This is what Do you have any advice for your, we usually say like three things, but you know, you can pick however many (laughs) things you want. (laughs) What would you tell your younger self? That's a good question. I contemplate this a lot, to be honest. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I usually am thinking about my future self, but my future self tell me now, Ah. but to tell my younger self or my previous self, I mean, I think it's, you're, you're stronger than you think you are. Right. Like just because like you don't, hmm. not everybody has to get it. Not everybody has to get the path that you're on or that you want to be on in order for you to walk it. You don't need validation. You don't need permission. If you're within your integrity and you're within your values and you're within what you believe to be the most right that you can do right now, you know, without it getting in your way, that's enough. You don't need more. Mm. Take the action. And clarity comes through action. Uh You can't think your way through everything. Sometimes you need to gather more information. I try to call it a behavioral experiment because it sounds less dangerous (laughs) when I'm going to do something scary because then it kind of relieves the pressure, right? Because when you think of it as an experiment, experiments don't have to go according to plan to be worthwhile, Like they still will provide evidence. They still will provide information. They'll give you a new direction to go to through for your next experiment. It's not that serious, Mm -hmm. right? But when we're living it, sometimes it feels really pressured or really serious. And then we get stuck into inaction, right? And so whatever, however you need to talk to yourself to figure out how to take the action, which will bring you more clarity and more information find the, those words mm-hmm. <laughs> to be able to get yourself to, to move because where you're at right now is just as painful as the discomfort of trying something new. Mm-hmm. I love that. You said, so which pain are you going to choose? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Behavioral experiment. I love that. Yeah. I would say it's even so. probably even more painful to stew in it and not right. do the action than actually doing the action. Most of the time. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. It just is weird because it's a, pain that you're um, habituated to so it doesn't feel as or it feels less scary than the pain that you're not habituated to but i would agree with you staying stuck is a soul sucker (laughs) it's not it's not a fun way to live and if you're so afraid of taking action that you're staying stuck that's the problem thought right so whatever language you need to play with i use behavioral experiment and then there's other things that I do, right? So I'm I'm kind of on like a healing journey right now. Like being burnt out for so long left me with a lot of autoimmune conditions. And I, I've had like a eating disorder that I had for a really long time left me with a lot of problems. And so I, what I call like working out, like everybody else calls it, right? Because I've got to build the muscle mm-hmm. to help with the inflammation or whatever. I, I call it physical healing, physical, mm-hmm. physical healing. Yes. <laughs> Because that's the words that I need to be able to put, be able to move myself in the direction of what I need in my behavioral experiment. Because for me, working out was a charged word, right? It's all back to language. Again. Yep. You're just reframing <laughs> it, right? Yeah. So you're more motivated. Thank you. Reframing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Lots of good stuff. <laughs> I love it. 
where can people find you? If they want to locate you. Yeah. So my primary platform is Mindfully Mallory on Instagram. I have a YouTube with the same name. My website is Mindfully Mallory. You can find my book on Amazon, Mallory Anderson Macy. And I probably, I've got TikTok too, but those are my primary platforms. <laughs> final words or anything else you wanted to share no i mean i think it's just keep keep moving towards what matters to you keep getting clear on what matters to you right and be honest with yourself about what matters someone else doesn't have to get it for it to still be something amazing for you to move towards and find someone who does even just one person even if you can't ever speak to them consume their content or read their books or if you can speak to them do it set up a thing, start a book club, whatever you need to do, be the change that you want to see, you know? Who or what's important to you and then move towards that. Mm -hmm. That's the... That's it. That's it, really, then, is our purpose. The meaning of life. The meaning. There you go. Wow, we solved it. (laughs) Did we nail it? (laughs) The meaning of life. We got it. This is awesome, guys. (laughs) We figured it out. (laughs) Well, Mallory, this is awesome. You're you're great. Thank you for your time. Uh, Let's keep in touch and uh, talk soon. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mallory. You. Happy holidays. Bye. Yeah, happy holidays, you guys. Thank this was you. great. I really appreciate the invite. Yeah, Anytime. Thank you. Okay, definitely. All right. Bye.